Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's all stand and begin our service tonight. Praise God. Looking forward to what God's going to do in this place. The Bible tells me that this is the day that the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. That's going to be my choice, Brother Sandy. It's going to be my choice tonight. Amen, amen. We want, we want to go to the Lord in prayer right now. If you have a need, just make it known by the raising of your hand. Let's take these needs to the Lord right now. Lord, we love you. God, we bring these needs before you tonight, God. You know the end from the beginning, God. Lord, we release faith in this place tonight, God, knowing you're a healer, knowing you're a deliverer, God, knowing, Lord, that you're still a Savior, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to meet these needs according to your will, Lord. The prodigal that's walked away, God, we ask you, Lord, that you draw them back, Lord. Those that didn't know, know you at all, God, we ask you, Lord, that you move in their life, you move in their heart, God. You draw them, Lord. Hallelujah. Those that need healing, Lord, God, God. Reach down tonight, God.
when you found him, you found it all. I said, when you found him, you found it all. You don't have to go looking for anything else in your life. He'll satisfy whatever longing that you need. He'll be whatever that you need. He is the great I am, Brother Tripp. John 6, 66 through 69 says, And from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Then Simon answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Where are we going to go? Who are we going to go to? There's nobody else for me to turn to. Nobody. Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. When you find him, you found it all. When you found him, you found it all. And I'm so glad, Brother, Brother Blake, that I found him. I found him a long time ago. Up and down, up and down. But he's always been constant in my life. Always been constant in my life, and I'm so thankful for that. Sister Heidi, will you put the ways to give on the board, please? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. We got Givelify. I use that a lot. PayPal. We got cash and checks to be mailed to Riverbend Pentecostal. P.O. Box 477, New Matter, Missouri 63869. We have text to give. And I'm not seeing the number on the board right now, but there is so many different ways. 833-883-9311. <laughs> We're going to say this prayer, and we always say it. Many of these men say it. I'll say it. This prayer works. It really works. Repeat after me. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given unto me. Press down, shaking together, and running over. I'm a tither, and I give my offerings. I bring them today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there's not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received. My whole family saved and serving God in perfect health and abundance, walking in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, and I'm blessed going out, and all that I do prosper in Jesus' name. Tithing on the inside, offering on the outside.
house tonight. Hallelujah. He's here. Hallelujah. Whatever you need from him, you can receive it tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. I like what I feel here tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's just worship him a little while longer. Come on, hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Praise your name. You may be seated. For all the children to come up front tonight and get ready to go back to Children's Church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. How many of you believe the Lord can use these young children? Amen. They don't. They don't. They don't have to wait till they grow up. The Bible talks about being as little children. They can reach someone that we can't reach. Right. Just by the way they conduct themselves and the way they act. Amen. Let's just stretch our hand out for them. Try and pray for them tonight. Lord, we love you. God, we pray for each and every one of these children tonight. God, I pray a hedge of protection around them, God. Lord, I pray angels of protection around them, God. I pray, God, that you use them, Lord, wherever they might be, God. That you would use them, Lord, to speak faith, God. To show you, Lord, in their life, God. Lord, to make them more. Lead them back, brother Blake. Hallelujah. Come on. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Blake, Sister Katie's going to be teaching tonight. Young people, come forward, please. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Good-looking crowd of kids, young young men and women, should I say? <laughs> amen, amen. Hallelujah. Let's pray for them. Hallelujah, Lord. We love you. Lord, we love you. God, I ask you, Lord. Hedge of protection around them, God. Angels of protection around them, God. Use them mind, Lord. For your glory, God. Lead and guide each and every one of them, God. Lord, you make them more what you want them to be, God. You work the work in their life, God. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Strengthen them, Lord. Be with them. Give them boldness, Lord. Well, it feels good to be in church again. I met a man today who looked so down and out. I know because I've been that way before. But I found peace and happiness I can enjoy because it's a good life living for the Lord. Is it? Is it? The psalmist, I feel Jesus in the house. The psalmist said, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. I concur with that. It feels good to be in the house of the Lord. While they're handing the handouts out, working on a working on another series, I've got a book that I'm started. And, uh, I'm not just not sure how we're going to work it out, but uh, uh, in the meantime, I'm going where I feel like the Lord leads me on an individual service by service basis, and uh, um, 
So tonight we'll uh, be speaking to you on the subject I've entitled. I actually struggled a little bit with the title, but this present dilemma, this present dilemma where we found ourselves. Uh, give them just a minute more. It's good to see everybody in the house of the Lord tonight. We have, we do have several that are not able to be here, and uh, I want to encourage you. Uh, the Bible says for a reason. The closer we get to the end, you go to church more. And uh, and and I I know we don't have Sunday night service as we used to, but I also know that we come together more than we ever did. And uh, uh, but uh, and I'm gonna tell you this. As your pastor, this is not just preacher talking. This is pastor speaking. There is nothing in your life that can't get fixed in the presence of the Lord. Nothing. So uh, uh, I've said this. I, I will repeat it. The day my grandma was killed in a car wreck Easter Sunday, I came to church. The day we buried my daddy, I came to church. Not to get roses pinned on me, not, not because I wanted a pen, not because I wanted a number on the wall, but because at the lowest times in my life, I needed it more than I ever had before. So, uh, uh, and I'm thankful for every one of you that are here. It's always a good looking congregation, but I'm never going to be happy. I hope y'all know that. I'm not going to be happy till it's full up, wall to wall front to back, I'm not going to be happy. And uh, uh, I had another preacher come to me Friday night, at, I mean Sunday night at the rally and tell me basically the Lord's going to do what everybody else has been saying he's going to do. He's going to fill this place up and uh, don't, don't be surprised. Um, I love... I have, I, I inherited it from my dad, but now I have it online, Zondervan Pictorial Bible Dictionary, and I, uh, if, you, if you don't have a copy of it, thank you, brother, a little quicker next time. <laughs> Old Christian, easy, easy, but a uh, lot, of, lot of great information in that Bible Dictionary, and we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter number 1 tonight. And most theologians agree that 1 Peter was a letter written by Simon Peter, Acts chapter 2 Peter, Matthew chapter 16 Peter, somewhere around 64 A.D., which is about 35 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And how many of you remember when 35 years seemed like a, long, a lot longer than it does now? Huh? 35 years goes by in a blink. I'll soon be out of high school for 35 years. Uh, so about 35 years have passed since Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and the day of Pentecost, which happened 40 or 50 days after Jesus' crucifixion. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, just for clarity's sake, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, etc., are provinces of Asia Minor, cities of, in Asia Minor on the western end of the Turkish Peninsula. If you want to look it up on, on Google, which I did to see, it's surrounded, it's, it's on three sides, the Black Sea to the north, the Aegean Sea to the uh, uh, west, and the Mediterranean Sea to the south, I believe it is. This book or letter was written to strangers. Now, at first glance, when he calls them strangers, what would you think he was talking about? When he said it's written to strangers. People he didn't know. People he wasn't acquainted with. Well, that's while that's a good call, it's not right. Because this book or letter was... Man, oh, Holy Ghost, I need you to help me because I really need to minister tonight. Those of you that are watching with us online, let the Lord speak to you tonight. 
He calls them strangers because they have been scattered or driven to places beyond what was familiar to them and to which they would have been familiar. They are in strange places where they are strangers. It's not that they're strangers to Simon Peter. It's that the, the place they have found themselves in is strange to them. They are foreign to the place they've been. Circumstances have driven them to a place where they are unfamiliar and is unfamiliar to them. The connect point I want you to make, and I hope you notice I've given you a little, little exercise there in your handout, is being somewhere that's unfamiliar for them on all levels. The first unfamiliarity would have been a geographical change, but with the geographical change comes a social, relational, and cultural change. Has anybody ever been the new kid at school? It's miserable. It's miserable. That's what's happening to them. All right? When, when you are somewhere you are not familiar, where you are unfamiliar to them and they are unfamiliar to you. In short, their mental state or their emotional state or actually their entire state would be a height of discombobulation which means confused, bewildered, or confounded because they are in a place they didn't expect to be, they didn't necessarily want to be, but circumstances have driven them there. What does that mean to us? How do we connect to that? Being somewhere that is unfamiliar spiritually, mentally, emotionally, socially, relationally, physical, etc. So I want to tell you, be careful. Everybody say, be careful. be careful. When you speak or act in damning a strange place before you find out why you're there. I'm speaking to some people tonight that you still live in that same house, you still sleep in the same bed, you still drive the same car, you still go to the same job, but you have found yourself in an unfamiliar place and you're vulnerable. Yeah. You're vulnerable there. Strangers. The first addressee is strangers who have been scattered, who have been driven from their place of comfort from their place of familiarity, strangers. But then verse number two, he says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Now I want you to look at this description. Strangers... Strangers speaks to where they are and how they feel right now. Strangers speaks to how they are being treated where they're at right now. Nobody wants to sit with them in the lunchroom. Nobody wants to play with them on the playground. They have found themselves in a place where they don't feel comfortable. They feel out of kilter. They feel out of sorts. And strangers speaks. Oh, come on, Holy Ghost, help me right now because I just want to bust through like the Kool-Aid man. <laughs> strangers speaks to where they are and how they feel and how they're being treated. They're being treated like outcasts. And how they feel is being validated by who's around them and making them feel like they don't belong here. Is anybody connecting to what I'm saying right now? But then the man of God in the next, very next verse, he says, elect, which is an address to them. They are strangers, but they are the elect. And what this speaks to is to their standing with God and how their unfamiliarity with where they are hasn't affected and cannot affect who they are. 
Just because you're in a place that seems strange and uncomfortable and your feelings are bubbling inside of you and you don't feel like you belong, rest assured, the most important place where your identity is registered at has not changed. God still knows who you are. God still knows what he called you to do. God still got his hand on you and his eyes on you. Just because you're uncomfortable does not mean your identity's changed in heaven. Their standing with or their identity in God hasn't been affected by their address change. But elect refers to more than simply a chosen people as the Jews were, but it is a personal, individual choosing. It is a, a personal election. They're not riding in on anybody else's coattails or not because of who their mama or daddy is, but they've been chosen specifically for one reason. Anybody know what that is? Anybody ever read that scripture before? Maybe anybody even read it tonight while it's been up on the screen? You're going too far. You want to know why so many people feel like they're living in hell? It's because God has an identity for you. There is an identity of who you are that God has been planned, has planned on you being since before creation and you're not there and you can't fit, you can't find comfort, you can't find peace, you can't find solace because you're trying to live your life in his world. Your identity came according to the foreknowledge of of God the Father. Now, for crying out loud, how many times have I preached that to you lately? From the looks of things, about once, right now. I preached about the Logos, how many times? In the beginning was the Word, the Word, the Logos is the plan of God as it was from the beginning. All right, God's got a plan for you, but you're trying to be a square peg fitting into a round hole, and it's not ever going to work. We've got to submit our lives to the ultimate will of God, whatever he says. We are elect because of who we are to him, and we are never going to find that which we desire trying to get it lined out on this world. The foreknowledge of God the Father in Romans chapter 9 verse number 11. He's referring to Jacob and Esau whom we know Esau was the elder brother and he had the birthright and he had the blessing and Jacob was the younger brother and he wanted what the older brother had. But because God had prophesied that was the way it's going to be and their purpose was determined by God because 9 and 11 says for the children hadn't even been born yet. They hadn't done no good or evil yet. But the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works but of him that calleth. Okay, well, I'm going to ask you, why are you here tonight? And the ladies at the mission are going to say, because we got to come if we're at the mission. And some kids are here going to say, because mama made us. And I'll say, the devil is a lie. You are here because God called you to be here. I don't think I'm out of the will of God tonight. I don't think I should be preaching in another church somewhere. I think it's this one. One of the reasons why we're struggling so much finding peace is because we're trying to do it our way still. You have no identity in this life beyond that of the one you have in Jesus Christ. There is none. There is none. You remember I told you the first line of the book the singer says, for most who live, hell is never knowing who they are. I'm trying to help you tonight to learn the, that there's more to your life than just what's in this present dilemma. You are elect. I know you feel like a stranger. 
I know you're trying to find your role and find to try and, trying to find your place and I know you want to find where to get comfortable and I know all of that, but you're not and it's, there's a reason for it and we're going to unpack that. That the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. God decided what he wanted out of you before you were ever born. You believe that? Well, in case you don't believe it, let's go to the word. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 4, according. First word, according. For some reason, that's in a whole bunch of stuff we're going to read tonight. According. As he hath chosen us in him before, everybody say before, before. the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. I know it sings a good song, and I agree with it to a point, but whoever wrote, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind, was about 4,000 years too late. The reason why there is a world is because he needed somewhere to put you. I want it to sink in. Hey, don't sell out like no chump. Don't go out like no sissy. Don't go out cheap. Don't go, don't, don't give up cheap. God's called you to the kingdom for such a time as this. But it's been in his plan since way back. Brother David, I promise he's not scrambling around trying to figure out what to do with this motley crew. He's got a plan for you, and he wants to reveal it to you. He wants to show it to us. Look here. For we are his workmanship, Ephesians 2 and 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Created unto good works. What you do matters. It matters. You were created to do a good work as the hands, the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the feet of Jesus Christ in this world created in him unto good works which God hath before. Everybody say before. He didn't wait till you were born to decide what to do with you. Y'all remember? He told Jeremiah, before you was in your mama, I knew you. And when you got in your mama, I sanctified you. I've got a plan for you. I've got a word for you. And it's way bigger than your present dilemma. Everybody with me? So let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Elect. Strangers, everybody say strangers. strangers. He spoke to where they wanted to be spoke to right then. You understand that? When we get in a mess, we want somebody to notice it. I uh, don't everybody turn holy on me. I know when you show up here and your lips stuck out about that far. And you sit down and, <sighs> and you look around and see who noticed. Who noticed how pitiful you look right then? And when somebody finally comes over and says, are you okay? Y'all know I'm telling the truth right now. We need to get an Oscar sometimes for the acting we put on to make people notice our dilemma. When he called them strangers, Sister Leanne, it made them happy. But when he called them elect, they weren't sure he was talking to the right people because our identity is too often determined by our present feeling. Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. But I'm happy to tell you that your feelings have nothing to do with who you are. 
You are the elect, chosen by God before the foundation of the world. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. I do not be, I'm not sure we believe that. I am not sure we believe that. Because is there anybody but me, when I read that right there, my past just automatically flies up on a movie screen? And I'm like, mm-mm, that was for everybody else. See this? This is a movie screen. See this? Can I tell you tonight, can I tell somebody tonight, nothing you've ever done caught God by surprise. We don't believe it. We still don't believe it. We don't believe it. Hear me when I tell you. God is not intimidated by your past. He is not intimidated by our failures, no matter how ugly they are. One of these days, Brother Shannon, we're going to get it. We're going to get it. Let me tell you, unfortunately, what has to happen for us to get it we have to go there or somebody very close to us that matters to us has to go there and then we have to want to believe that it's true. As long as we don't think we've been in the slime pit, as long as we don't think yeah. we've been in the quagmire, yeah. we don't really know if we're buying this or not. But when somebody that you love and somebody that matters to you jumps off the cliff of sin into degradation and failure and shame, yeah. then you're going to want this to be true. Believe me, the Bible is true. Brother Christian, you see that? As you grow in preaching more stuff, preach the truth whether they believe it or not. That's not a joke. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. The reason why I'm getting some backlash right now is because some of us just want to be known as strangers because we don't feel very elect right now. We don't feel very victorious right now. We don't feel like we're overcomers right now. Matter of fact, some of us didn't know if we was going to make it through the day or not. Can I get a witness? I don't want you coming in here on a Wednesday night. I barely made it anyway. I drug in here and I fought hell all day long and I fought the devil and the devil got a name. All them people I work with, live with, hang out with, sleep with, whatever. I don't want you talking about how great I am. I don't want you talking about all the great things I can do. I just want to sit here and waller and suck my thumb and be a stranger. Is anybody feeling that? What did that lady say? You picking up what I'm putting down? Huh? I, I'm not in my notes right now, but I'm in the spirit. I'm not going to let you stay holding on to your blanket and suck your thumb. Because I'm getting, he got toshon, dolo bosa, taha. I'm getting a glimpse of what he sees. And he's got way too much for you to do. He's got way too big of plans for you. He's got way too big of dreams for you. For you to just continue to sit there and hum and whine and complain. Yes, you're going through some junk. Yes, we're going through some problems. But you're going to come out, baby. And you're going to come out better than you ever were. Because you might, y'all feel that? Y'all feel the Holy Ghost in here? I'm telling you. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is moving in this place tonight. They just like being strangers. They like being pitiful. You know what? What do you think they wanted Simon Peter to say to him? What do you think they wanted to hear him say? Pack your bag, sweetie. I'm going to take you back where you came from. That's not what the letter's about. The letter's about wherever you are and however you got there. I want you to know who you are in him. <laughs> through the foreknowledge, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. Pastor, you was doing good till you brought up that cuss word again. <laughs> sanctification. 
That's growth and maturity. That is the process by ah, that is the process by which God forms you and sets you apart for his purpose. That's the process whereby God is molding you on the wheel and creating you as a vessel for his good pleasure. But look at this. One of the most difficult things that I have faced as a pastor of this church is holy people. Because there is a time in our natural thinking where we believe we've arrived. Now you know why you feel like a stranger. It's because God knows by our natural tendencies that if we ever feel like we've arrived, we stop being hungry, we stop being thirsty, we stop pressing, we stop pushing, and we just put her on cruise control and take it easy. But unfortunately, I'm telling you that when you put it on cruise control, the church is going pedal to the metal and you're going to get left behind. Growth and maturity result in continued obedience. And you don't have continued obedience without continued submission. Say, well, I don't want to do that. Why do you think they call it submission? He didn't say you got to want to. He said do it. But Brother Chris, the beautiful thing is, is when we submit ourselves and do it, Guess what we find out? It was the best way all along, and now I want to. Huh? Won't you just give in? Let God be God. Growth and maturity, that's the sanctification process, result in continued obedience. And the reason why it's going to continually work that way is if not, a sense of entitlement by seniority will rise up in us. I want you to compare and contrast what it means, how you see election, elect as determined by God, and elect as determined by us. Growth and maturity resulting in continued obedience and alignment with the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, which is a type of the establishment of the new covenant, because when they established the old covenant, Moses put half the blood in a bucket and half the blood on the altar, and then he took the blood from the bucket and sprinkled it on the people. I believe that's Exodus 28, I think. Don't quote me on that. A better covenant built on better promises. But here's where I want to focus at for a few minutes, and then we'll finish this Bible study. These people that he's writing to and these people that I'm speaking to, them knowing who they are is imperative in the overall purpose of this letter. Now, these people that he's writing to, Brother Terrence, it's about to get rough in here, okay? So you still got my back. You, you've been kind of tough on me the last couple services, but I hope that's because you love me, not because you going the other way. <laughs> Them knowing who they are is imperative in the overall purpose of this letter. These people are experiencing incredible suffering. Everybody say suffering. suffering. Oppression and opposition. And as a result, Here's why he wrote the letter, Brother Ronnie. They are experiencing incredible suffering. And as a result, they've become discouraged and they're in danger of giving in. Because it feels like everything's against them. Now, I've got to tell you something. First thing we're going to have to define 
is are we suffering because God's trying to do something in our life or are we suffering because we keep making bad decisions? Are we suffering because of the decisions we keep making? Or is God doing something? Are we on the wheel? We got to come to that conclusion. The purpose of this letter can be simply defined as to encourage holy conduct in the face of suffering by assuring the readers of their coming reward. Here's the dilemma. Here's the dilemma. Suffering feels the same no matter why you're there. Getting out of your present dilemma cannot be your goal. Finding and maintaining who you are in spite of your dilemma is the goal. Now, Brother David, Paul got this. He got that. That's why he manifested it in his ability to keep winning souls no matter where he was. Even in prison. We've read that. We've talked about that. They had to put Paul's guards on like a real short shift. Y'all ever read about that? Because if they left them there longer than like two hours, he'd have them repented, baptized in Jesus' name and full of the Holy Ghost. They had to change his guards. He's in prison. I said, he's in prison, and they got to protect the guards from him. You better start figuring out who you are because in the middle of your dilemma, in the middle of your struggle, in the middle of your trial, God has got somebody that you need to minister to, and you can't do it with your thumb in your mouth. To encourage holy conduct in the face of suffering by assuring the readers of their coming reward. The source of the dilemma I'm in is either God's doing a work or I made poor decisions or there's a third reason. I surrounded myself with a bunch of dummies making poor decisions and I have become collateral damage because of misplaced loyalties. At this moment, especially in the recovery side, but at this moment, there are two things hindering people from growing in God. Two, primary. One thing is romance. Stop trying to romance when you don't know how to have healthy relationship. Did I say that out loud? Stop. Your identity is not in another man or another woman. It's in Jesus Christ. I know, Kevin. I know, Kevin. He tells me all the time. You say that because you got a wife. Now, now, nobody didn't pull your string. I just was talking. The second one is, the second thing that holds people back worse than anything is misappropriated loyalty. I was going to say something about Brother Christian, but I, I done picked on him a couple times. But I used to be a plumber. You know what you don't ever see? Y'all remember Toddy? Anybody remember Toddy? Toddy's a cool old guy. But he was a painter. And he wore white all the time, right? Plumbers don't wear white. Because you can't mess around with that stuff without getting it on you. I 
I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna to Hank Snow it right now. But <laughs> trust me, know when I'm telling you the truth. You've got to stop calling the result of poor decisions the work of God in your life because it ain't. Sometimes you're just reaping what you sowed. I was doing good, Brother Christian, until I started talking about you may be a stranger because you keep making bad decisions and running with the wrong people. Mama taught you that in kindergarten. She taught you that in first grade, second grade, third grade, and it's still applicable when you're 65 years old. You cannot run with the wrong crowd and expect to be right with God. You can't. Unless you're running with them with your search for truth chart under your arm. <coughs> Teaching them all a Bible study. You ain't, oh Lord. You ain't going to win them by going to the rodeo with them. <laughs> Setting up a row of drinks with them. pastor name is fun is just preaching in case y'all was wondering you're not you, you you can't you can't go out you can't help them if they don't want to be helped and if they want to be helped you know how you're going to find out they're going to come for it brother shannon taught me that actually brother brother randy brown taught me that he won't take you to his facility recovery house for men 12 months he won't take you to his facility until he can call you seven days in a row at the exact same time and you'll answer the phone. No, no, wrong. You call him seven days in a row at the exact same time. And you know what his rationale is? If I told you I was going to give you some dope seven days in a row at the same time, you'd be calling me. Now, we talk about dope and stuff a lot. I got to be honest with you. Right this minute, I ain't all that worried about dope. We got a program to get rid of that. But it's some of this other stuff. <laughs> all right. I told you I'm Hank Snowing. If it is God bringing this on me, I can't leave it without becoming what it was intended to make me. And if it ain't God, <coughs> does anybody know what you do if you find yourself in a mess and God didn't do it? What do you do? You wish. You wish it was just that easy just to get out. Why ain't y'all done it? Huh? You call on him. You call on him. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and then I'll heal their land and I will forgive their sin. The first step to getting out of a mess that you got yourself in is call on the Lord. He will never... I'm a living witness and a testimony to tell you. Not one time did I call on him and he say, hmm, let me think about it. You know you deserve this. You know you got yourself. Not one time did he start giving me the business. But every time when I called on him, Brother Terrence, he was there. Every time I walked into church, oh, hallelujah. I walked into church planning on being a servant, Brother David, planning on sitting on the back row. But when I walked into the house of the Lord, he grabbed a hold of me. He told me that he loved me. He let his presence saturate me. It's the same thing. Call on him. They, I think they sing it tonight. But when I call on him, he answers. But here's the problem. I got to call on him. And then I got to surrender to what he tells me to do. That's the problem. Because how many of us right now, the unfamiliar place we're in is Samaria riding on a chariot mad at the prophet 
because he told us to go to the River Jordan. And we wanted to go to the pretty rivers back in our country, back in our homeland, back in Arbana and far, far. The rivers of my land, they're better than the one of Jordan. But the Lord said, and the servant said, Master, hey, hey, boss, if he had asked you to have done some great thing, would you have done it? You know what Naaman had to say? Yep. I'm a dummy. Show me the way. Show me the way to the river. And the Bible said he, dipped, he dumped down in it one time. Nothing happened. He dunked down in it two, three, four, five, and six times, and nothing happened. But he wasn't done doing what God said. Because when he went down the seventh time, he came up out of that water, and all the leprosy was gone off of him, and his skin was like a brand new baby, and it was a new day. One might say Naaman found himself born again. All right. I've got to do what he says when I call on him. While being aware that there may be a price I have to pay for getting out of his will in the first place. Ask David about that. Ask Samson about that. Ask Solomon about that. Ask Saul about that. There are four primary messages in this letter. The first is the greatness of our salvation. The second is the call to sanctification. The scriptures are there where those are at in your handout. The third is the need for submission. And the fourth is a proper response to suffering. It's these four things that are in this letter. Not one time is you're coming out. Verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according, here's, I told you it was here a bunch, didn't I? According to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, we got to understand something. Salvation through the mercy of God was never my idea, but his. My many sins, my failures, my struggles, etc., are canceled out by the abundance of his mercy. But here I tried to talk about this last night at recovery. And... We'll talk about it. I think I tried to talk about it at Element Sunday. If all he did was cancel our sins, he would just leave us with the same chalkboard to write on again. He would do nothing but give me a clean slate, but nothing would be changed. <clears throat> We're not simply looking for a behavior change. Because anybody can do that at any given time or any given day. We're looking for a nature change. We want to get to the roots of why I keep finding myself in these dilemmas. Hear me. We're not looking to just feel better. We want to be healed. And that's the hope of the new birth. God is calling us to healing. But there's a problem in that. In order for us to be healed, the old man is going to have to die. Look here. According to his abundant mercy, he has given us new birth and new life unto a living hope. Now, I don't know what your choices are, but you've got one to make. It's we're at one of those, I hadn't talked about it in a while, we're at one of those points of tension. But our hope in Jesus Christ is a living hope. Living is important is that the hope of Jesus Christ is not, 
is not connected to anything that's dead or dying. You know what I mean by that? We think if I could just get this or if I could just have this or if this would just happen or that would just happen or if we all know if I got a new house or if I got a new car or if I could just get that pair of shoes or if I could have just got that dude or that gal, all of that stuff is either dead or dying. But the hope we have in him, Brother Larry, is a living hope. A living hope. Let me talk about that just a little bit and then maybe we'll close up. Look here. A living hope. Living is important in that it isn't connected to that which is dead or dying or temporal and in nature but that which is alive and eternal. Everybody say eternal. eternal. Listen, Romans 8, 31 through 34. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how, she, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? I'm not done, but I want to ask you, who told you you were done? Who told you that you couldn't become what God told you you could become? <coughs> who told you that you couldn't take this no more? Who told you you weren't going to make it? Who told you you were condemned? Who is it? The Lord's asking. It's a rhetorical question because look here. We know this. It is Christ that died. Okay. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God? I don't have time to talk about that, but this ain't got nothing to do with the Trinity. For one thing, God don't have a right hand. Okay who also maketh intercession for us. ETH means continual. Calvary continues to work on our behalf. Here we got to talk about this a minute. What, what does that say to you? So who is it that says I'm done? Anybody in here have to struggle with that? Anybody in here have to struggle with that? There's like two people raise their hand. We, we all do. I, I've got to the place, Brother Cody, that I, listen, I have a whole war right here. I can think something stupid. I can convince myself because I thought it, God's done with me. I didn't say nothing. I didn't do nothing. I just thunk it. But the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Jesus died but he rose again. And he also continually maketh intercession for us. What does that tell you? What would you say brother David? He's fighting for us. You want to know why? You want to know why? Because he believes in you. He believes in you because he's got a plan for you. He's got dreams for you. Listen, let's, let's move on. Look here. First John chapter 1, verse number 8, 9, and 10. All right. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
Yep, don't get too many amens when you read that scripture. But look at verse number nine. How beautiful. How powerful. He said, I know you all mess up. And I'm not intimidated by it. Matter of fact, that's what I died for. I, I'm not preaching. And I know some people like to, when I preach this, when we preach grace, I remember Brother Jeff Arnold told me. He preached a message on mercy at Because of the Times. I'm sure some of you have watched it before. About the mercy of God and about the gifts and the calling of God being without repentance and, and about restoration from, from horrible sins. And Brother N.A. Urshan went to him after the service and said, that was the greatest message, on one of the greatest messages on mercy I've ever heard. But you're going to pay a horrible price for preaching it. He said he never got home yet till he was canceled for the rest of the year. Why is it that we have such a problem with mercy? Because we don't really believe it. I went back and watched the message. He was right. Oh, my Lord, I feel something heavy in the room right now. I feel something powerful in this room right now. He did save the book, and such were some of you. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and, and, and. There was somebody here that preached this message here a while back, and it was good. His anger endureth but for a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for the night. You've not gone too far. You've not messed up too much. But you got to own it. You got to own it. You got to tell the Lord, it was me. I was wrong, and I'm sorry. I did it. I did it. If we confess our sins, Brother David, look what it says. He is faithful and just. You know what that word just means? Righteous. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what that means? The doo-doo left over. That's why I love it, Brother Larry. It's going to sound almost just like you. This is what you... I'm praying God come. That's what we want. That's what we need. We don't need him to come around to our way of thinking. We don't need him to give in and just let us do what we want to do. We need to recognize, you know what? I got it wrong, but I read the word, and the word says all I got to do is confess it to him, and he will be faithful and just to forgive me. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. I like it. Let me get here. And then we'll bring it home. My little children. My little children. These things write I unto you that you sin not. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nowhere in the Bible, including the scriptures that I just read to you, that say 
we all sin every day. It is not a foregone conclusion that you're going to be a sinner all the time. And I don't know if we believe that either. You have the power of the Holy Ghost within you that every crossroads between righteousness and sin that you come to, you can make the right decision. My little children, I write these things to you that you sin not. And if any man sin, yep, even the ones you're thinking about right now, the bad ones, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. What's that word advocate mean? Have you ever looked it up? It means he's our attorney, our defense attorney. And he is the propitiation. There's a word you can use in Scrabble. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. That means what it says. What is propitiation? I knew you was going to ask that. See, sin demanded death. We owe a debt to God that can only be paid through our death. The payment required is death. Jesus Christ came, took took that debt upon his own account and paid it with his life. And he did it for everyone, not just the sins of those that lived in or the disciples or the good people or the people in the Bible, but for everybody. Calvary was good enough to save the world. He made a way when there was no way. I said he made a way when there was no way. You think after all the trouble he went to to purchase our salvation that the little old piddly stuff that you've done he's going to say is bigger than what I paid? You really believe that? That's the lie the devil tries to tell us. Huh? For some reason, I remember being 10, 11, 12 years old. Tell a lie. And I felt these words in my mind. You done messed up too much. He ain't never going to forgive you. You knew better and did it anyway. He made a way when there isn't a way. The key element to the efficacy of what Jesus did is what? Faith. Faith. I have to believe that he did it all for me. In spite of all I've done that was contrary to what he wanted, there is something in us. It was placed in us by the creative word of God. And without finding it and activating it, you and I will never be complete. So stop looking for completion in dead and dying things. And get connected to the only thing that lives forever. Because when John turned around on the Lord's day in the spirit, he said, I saw one and I fell down his feet as dead. And he said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, which is, which was, and is to come, the Almighty. Get connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're a stranger, but you're also the elect of God. Let's stand. I got some more, but I'm done.
God bless you. Lord, I love you tonight. I thank you for your word. I thank you for promises. My prayer is that somewhere, somewhere in the hard, dry, packed turn roll, the wayside, that there's somehow that this seed can break through. I pray, Lord, that it can break through the thorns. It can break through the stubbornness and the pride and the fear and the lies of the devil. And we can realize you, you came all the way from heaven so we could make it, so we could overcome. And these sins we've committed, there's bigger ones than that already beneath the blood of Jesus. Help us to know it. Help us to believe it. I pray that the word rises up in here. We, 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 we are discouraged in so many cases. We are, but the discouragement feels the same. So help us feel, realize if we're here because we made bad decisions, lead us in the path of righteousness. We surrender to you. We confess our failures to you. But if we're here because you're doing a work for us, then just let us trust you. Increase our faith. And that what you're doing will be brought to completion. I love you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sunday morning is 10 o'clock is Elements. We're going to wrap up love, God willing. And uh, 11 o'clock is worship service. Brother Tripp will be preaching. Hope to see you there. God bless you. You're dismissed. <laughs>